Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second season of the Med Safety Exchange webinar series, a joint venture by the Institute for Safe Medication Practices Canada and the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. Just a reminder that this webinar will be recorded so that it's available to those who couldn't make it at this time. We have all the lines muted and we encourage any questions or comments to be typed to us in the chat box and then we'll read them out loud at the end of the webinar during the discussion period. The purpose of this webinar series is to provide a platform whereby we can share and learn from one another to minimize the recurrence of med incidents and optimize med safety in all care sites. The first six webinars from September 2017 to February 2018 served as a pilot run for the Med Safety Exchange, so we took an evaluation hiatus to take into account your feedback, needs, suggestions, comments, and reconfigure the webinars in the best way to meet those needs. We needed to identify what went well and what areas we could improve on for subsequent years so that everyone could get the most out of this initiative. I'll turn it over to Dr. Mike Hamilton of ISMP Canada to take a quick look at some of our findings and the subsequent changes made. Thank you, Ambika. Um, at the outset, the Med Safety Exchange really had three goals. And first, as Ambika mentioned, was increase awareness of incident and learning and sharing. The second was really providing a supportive venue to learn from each other in really what's become a collaborative way. And the third is to increase the value of medication safety related learnings and really the value of reporting and to show you and to show us and to reinforce to us that reporting and learning is, is such an important uh, um, concept in medication safety. And thanks to our audience, and in particular our presenters, we've advanced a long way towards these goals. I Simply Canada and CPSI is the producers of this series really want the Med Safety Exchange to be beneficial to you and your healthcare roles. And we want you to see its value. And we want the value to be measured by its ability to impact patient safety. So in the next few slides, we'll present an overview of the findings of your feedback. The audience for the first season of the Med Safety Exchange uh, averaged about 240 per webinar. And that ranged from 150 to around 300. And we were lucky to have representation from all provinces and most territories. And we're particularly pleased about that. We had participation from all across Canada. Relative to the populations within each province, um, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Nova Scotia, and the territories uh, were highly subscribed. And we'd certainly like that to continue. And we recognize we need to make inroads into all areas across Canada. And we encourage you to seek out your colleagues and have them join us in these uh, bi-monthly webinars. The Med Safety Exchange webinar presenters, which are represented by the um, icons uh, of a, a person in the figure, they came from a range of jurisdictions and reflected many roles within healthcare from a number of different practice areas. And we were pleased to have regular presentations from national organizations such as CPSI, Health Canada, us at ICP Canada and CIFR, Kai High and CSHP. I'm also happy to re report excellent response rates to our post-webinar survey, and we encourage you to continue to do so. We will make changes in response to your feedback. And I'm even more thrilled that you as healthcare providers found value and meaning and utility in these presentations. Firstly, participants were asked if the presented strategies, recommendations, and med safety related research would be valuable in improving your practice. And um, the majority of, of you responded uh, positively. Secondly, participants were asked if they would implement one or more recommendations in their practice to optimize medication safety. And again, most of you said yes. And this really indicates that the learning presented in each webinar can be applied to practice and you're willing to use it. Thirdly, participants were asked if the webinar demonstrated the value and importance of medication incident reporting. And by far the vast majority of you consistently selected positive statements for that question. And it's clear that the importance of reporting and analysis has been recognized. And we were particularly heartened by a lot of you who suggested we, we need to expand what we do in terms of presenting on medication safety issues 
from more categories of care sites, from more ambulatory or community-based sites, and from other uh, areas of care. So in summary, the feedback from the participants affirmed that the presentations were worthwhile, the presented strategies did influence your practices, and the webinars reaffirmed the value of reporting, sharing, and learning. So the suggestions we took for improvement included a, a wider variety of practice sites like home care, long-term care, community pharmacy, in addition to, to acute care. And so we encourage everyone to please reach out to us with your own medication safety incidents or your own medication safety initiatives in your own areas of practice. We also recognize that a slightly shorter webinar time um, accommodates better attendance, so we've reduced our schedule to 50 minutes. And we have uh, currently a, a bi-monthly predictable schedule of every, every two months. We also want you to continue your feedback, and we want to hear your suggestions for topics. We're always happy to work with you if you want to present a medication safety project or an incident or any associated learning, or if you simply want to discuss other issues in medication safety. So welcome to season two of the Medication Safety Exchange. Ambika. Thanks, Mike, and thanks to all of you who made that happen. Now for today's overview, every webinar will have roughly the same structure but with different content. So this webinar will have one med incident analysis regarding the safety considerations for fluid infusions in neonates and a description of a med safety initiative to minimize selection error between long-acting morphine products. This will be followed by the observatory for a med safety update and then finish up with a discussion period where we read out your comments and allow the speakers to elaborate. As before, anonymity is still a choice for all those involved, so I'll only introduce speakers briefly, and they can choose to share as much or as little as they'd like about themselves and or their practice site. I'd like to invite the first speaker to discuss an incident analysis involving fluid infusions in neonates with particular risk for infusion via gravity. Hi everyone, I'm Laura Wang. I'm a clinical pharmacist at the uh, Neonatal and Pediatric Pharmacy in Surrey and BC. And beside me I have Brandy Newby, who's the clinical for, uh, sorry, the coordinator for clinical and distribution services for the Neonatal and Pediatric Pharmacy. So our particular incident that we would like to describe is regarding um, an incident that occurred in uh, one of our premature babies. So this baby was a premature neonate, around 27 weeks gestation. Uh, born at around 800 grams. Um, in the neonatal world, uh, if our babies have any sort of blood sugar management issues um, or we're trying to control their blood sugars to within a normal range, we typically control that through the use of IV fluids. So if they have uh, a high sugar, then we would be changing IV fluids to have a, a lower dextrose content in the IV fluid, um, whereas if they have a low blood sugar, then we would be controlling it by changing it to a higher concentration of dextrose in, in their IV fluid bags. So in this particular incident, um, at, the, at the situation, the IV TPN rate was decreased, and then we had a secondary bag of a D10 fluid at that time, um, and there was an order to change the IV fluid bag from a D10W to a D5W as the baby was having hyperglycemia. So in the event, um, at around 6.20, the physician writes the orders to change the IV fluid bags from the D10 to the D5W. About 10 minutes later, the IV fluid bags were changed by the nurse. And about approximately an hour after the baby began to desaturate, required increased oxygenation and ventilation. And the baby was intubated at this time, but was extubated and re-intubated um, to see if that could have helped with the ventilation issues. At around 10.30, labs were drawn. 15 minutes later, the lab uh, notified the ward regarding some critical values. Um, one, that the sodium was undetectable under 90 millimoles per liter. The glucose was also undetectable, of greater than 40 millimoles per liter, and the lactic acid was at 4.4 millimoles per liter. Now, prior to this, um, the electrolytes and, uh, and the glucose levels were relatively normal, except for the higher glucose that required the change in IV fluids. 1120, um, the arterial blood work was done to repeat to, to be repeated as uh, it was such a, a different lab work that we wanted to. Um, confirmed that that was actually the case, and the results were similar. 
So symptomatic treatment with uh, hypertonic saline, insulin infusion, calcium infusion, and especially adjusted TPN was given for the baby. Um, wanted to help slowly correct the issues involved. After the incident, a clinical pharmacist, actually Brandy, who's next to me now, um, discovered that there was actually an empty 250 milliliter bag of D5W that was discarded earlier. One nurse confirmed the tubing was attached to the IV line, but was unsure if the clamps were open or closed. Uh, by that time, the trash was already emptied in the patient room, so we weren't able to identify um, the actual bag and tubing in question. A second nurse noticed a full or near full 250 ml bag of D5W hanging earlier at around 7 a.m. Other information that's pertinent is that the weight increased um, for the patient, about 150 grams pre-incident to post-incident. The urine output also increased around this time, about six to eight-fold from the pre-incident average. And the TPN contents, just to make sure, we, were, uh, we sent it to the lab for analysis, and it did confirm the correct concentration of ingredients that were ordered. So the, the topic in question is that we assume that the entire 250 ml bag of D5W was accidentally infused to the patient within a short time frame. Influence in neonates and pediatrics are a particular concern as a lot of our, our, our neonatal patients can be a similar weight to the fluids that's being administered. So, for example, especially if they're premature or low birth weight, um, some of the babies, we frequently have babies that are around a kilo. Um, and then we also have commercially available bags of IV fluids that's one liter, which would be the same weight as the baby. And if we were to sort of convert it to adult terms, if we were admitted um, as an average 70 kilo patient in the adult uh, wards, um, it'll be the equivalent of having like a 70 liter giant IV fluid bag hanging by our bedside. Contributing factors to the environment was that uh, at that time there was a lot of commotion, um, so it was a busy environment. There was a lack of manual safety check of bag to pump to patient. Commercially available fluid bags are sometimes too big for our neonates. The tubing allowed for free flow and the error may occur when bags are changed frequently or um, if attached without connection to the pump. Our recommendations at that time uh, were to do, have two nurses do an independent double check of the bag to pump to patient uh, check at fluid changes and at handover, choose the smallest size volume bag possible, have smaller commercially available solutions um, in common uh, used fluids such as D10W, and also to have all neonatal infusions delivered by pump, which the policy was already in place for us at that time. The other recommendations was to look for um, any sort of specialty IV tubing with safety features. So for example, any sort of um, uh, a tubing where, uh, which allowed for bag uh, volume of the fluid to go into a syringe first before to the patient as a specialty tubing, any sort of volume control devices and anti-free uh, anti flow devices. This is actually the third known incident um, that we are aware of. Um, so we recommended a permanent option without human dependence for safety as part of our plan. So Outcome-wise, temporarily we changed our um, standard uh, IV, um, IV fluid bag to a smaller size 50 mil D5W bag to flush medications that's incompatible with TPN. So this um, encompasses pretty much majority of our premature infants as most of them start off with uh, TPN for their nutri nutrient needs. So this is quite a big impact for us. Also to reinforce the importance of manual IV solution checks and also that if anyone were to find any empty bags around, um, not to discard the empty bags until investigation is complete. For long-term solutions, we wanted to administer all IV solutions via syringe pumps um, in a method that hopefully would require the delivery via pressure rather than gravity. So we would have to find specialty tubing and preferably something with a tubing that connects a large volume to a syringe so that we don't have to frequently change the volume uh, or change the IV fluid bag and limit the infection risk from the multiple changes. So some of the ones that we tested are shown um, in the next few slides. So one of the specialty tubing um, that we looked at was this volumetric cylinder type or barrette type tubing. Um, and this was the smart, set, uh, smart site low sorbing barrette set was the one that we tested. Um, however, this one still required a manual clamp before the cylinder, so, so still required a manual uh, 
check and manual action from, um, from, the, from the bedside nurses. Um, and we tested to see if the clamp was open, if the volume, if the cylinder can be volume limiting. However, this uh, volume uh, of the fluid started to free flow immediately. Another one that we checked was the Solaris Smart Site syringe ad uh, administration set, um, which was kind of in line with what we were looking for in terms of it was a bag to syringe to patient um, uh, setup. So how it works is that the IV fluid bag. Um, is connected to the whole tubing set, and the syringe is also connected to the whole tubing set. So when the syringe is, uh, the plunger is pulled back, the fluid from the IV bag will flow into the syringe, as illustrated in the blue arrows. And then when the syringe is pushed, then the volume goes from the syringe uh, to the patient, as followed by the green arrows. So this requires pressure to administer the fluid to the patient, which was sort of what we we're looking for. However, this product, when we tested it, also occasionally free flowed when the uh, bag or the tubing was moved. The third one that we tested um, was also a similar to the previous one, where it was a bag to syringe to patient, uh, specially designed tubing from a company called ICU Medical Inc. Um, and this one, when we tested it, had no free flow. So we're trying to see if we can um, use this product to implement our safety changes. Great. Thank you uh, so much for an excellent presentation with important learning. Uh, we had discussed the fact that this risk exists with adults as well, but the harm is much less likely to be seen as with neonates because of their relative size. So these considerations are important for all fluid infusions. <clears throat> I'd like to invite the second speaker to describe the med safety initiative to minimize selection error between long-acting morphine products. This is described in an acute care setting, but can be extrapolated to long-term care homes, community pharmacies, other care sites, because both long-acting products are available everywhere. Great. Thank you, Ambika, for the nice um, Introduction. My name is Stephanie Chan, and I'm the med safety pharmacist for Lower Mainland Pharmacy Services. And to, uh, today, uh, presenting with myself is Isabel Diogo, our practice consultant with med safety. So I'm going to, and um, also together with us here uh, for questions later, is uh, our Deborah Halkett and Jennifer Lee. So in 2016, an opioid crisis was declared in British Columbia, and in 2017, a total of 1,422 people died of an illicit drug overdose. In that same year in June, British Columbia Center for Substance Use and BC Ministry of Health published a new guideline for the clinical management of opioid use disorder. And then there it is stated that for patients who are unsuccessfully treated with first or second line agents, namely suboxone and methadone, Cadian, a 24-hour release morphine long-acting capsule, uh, could be considered an alternative. So in late 2017, Cadian was approved as part of the provincial formulary uh, based on this um, new indication. And up until late 2017, the BC provincial formulary only had a 12-hour release morphine long-acting product, with the primary branding used MS, uh, as an MS one. And so the 12-hour long-acting morphine product and the 24-hour long-acting morphine products are obviously different because of the mechanism and also because of the different types of indication you would use them for. So for example, if the patient is on 100 milligrams of Cadian, um, if you give them 100 milligrams of MS1 instead, you could easily, you could easily give them twice the, the dose because uh, the 100 milligrams of morphine is given over a 12-hour period rather than over the 24-hour period. So on the medication safety level, knowing that we have, would have two long-acting products in our formulary, we know that there is a potential for mix-up, and as illustrated earlier in the example, there could be risk for severe harm. So we've decided at this point to do an environmental scan to look at our current state of the time, and we know that KDM was procured on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. And we also looked at how the drug names are displayed across our pharmacy clinical system and how it's displayed on our packaging um, within our health organizations. And we noticed that MS1 and Cadian are both um, displayed quite similarly, that they're just called morphine long acting. And with MS1, there's no branding indicating uh, what brand it is. 
We also took a look at um, the incident reports that are related to our long-acting morphine products. We assessed the appearance of different morphine long-acting products as they appeared on PharmaNet-based uh, medication profiles. And for those of you not familiar with PharmaNet, it is a central database that has all the dispensing records from any community pharmacy in BC for the past 14 months. It is often used in access as a source of um, patient uh, medication history. So when we looked at um, the incident report, um, we found that selection errors of long-acting morphine products was definitely a recurrent theme. And we noticed that clinicians were challenged in deciphering between our long-acting morphine products on the PharmaNet profile. So to illustrate this, you can see uh, an example of how long-acting morphine products are displayed or appear uh, differently on the PharmaNet-based uh, medication reconciliation orders that we use for admission orders. So if you can uh, focus on Cadian on the left-hand side, it shows up as morphine sulfate 50 milligrams cap 24H PEL, um, or sometimes it could just show up as Cadian on PharmaNet. And if you look on your right-hand side under MS1, that displays as morphine sulfate 15 milligrams cap 12H PEL. So really the only difference between the two products is 24H versus 12H, which is very subtle. And um, to give you another example too, if you look at the other box under the MS1 box on your right-hand side, it reads morphine sulfate 30 milligrams tablet ER. So what that is is actually a generic brand, the Sandals brand of MS Content, which is another 12-hour long-acting morphine product. So as you can tell from this example, it's quite hard to tell all of them apart unless you've had previous experience with all these drugs. So at this point, we realized that um, prior to coming to any consensus about our mitigation strategies, we really needed to communicate with our frontline clinicians on an urgent basis that, you know, there are two different formulations of product long-acting capsules out there and that they're very different, they're not interchangeable, and they look different. So we came up with a practice alert and our um, educators went and uh, distributed this um, education. So on the regional level, um, we were considering what are the different levels of intervention that we could implement to mitigate risk from um, forcing functions being most effective and all the way to education. So when considering what's most effective, we know that forcing functions obviously comes first because it's the most effective. And so what are the things that we've considered is that we uh, consider removing our long-acting morphine products from work stock. Um, we wanted to provide um, only as patient-specific, so meaning only when there is a specific order for a specific patient that we would send the medication to the unit. And also utilizing our automated dispensing cabinet, or ADC, there's a function called pharmacy verification required, meaning that when a medication um, is entered into the pharmacy system, it's verified only when that happens that a nurse can actually access it through the ADC. And so, um, but obviously we have to balance our decisions with our patient population and needs our pharmacy hours of operation, and also the timeliness of medication delivery and administration. So other strategies that we've considered is um, standardization. So we updated our nomenclature, uh, meaning like how we name our products across the board in all our pharmacy systems so that we have consistent outputs everywhere, so that it looks the same in our automated dispensing, uh, dispensing cabinet, in all our, our medication packaging and labeling, in our MARS, in our patient profiles, and basically anything that's generated from our pharmacy systems would have the same output. And we've also decided to include both brand names for both products so that people can tell them apart more easily, and also to move the brand names up so that it's easier to see. And now I'm going to um, pass on the presentation to my partner, Isabel Diogo, uh, nursing background, uh, to discuss more about our medication strategies. Thank you, Stephanie. So another mitigation strategy that we put in place is the creation of a just-in-time alert in the automated dispensing cabinet, which for us is the Omnicell for nurses. We chose to create alerts for both Cadian and MS1. At the time when the nurse is removing either of these medications, 
from the OmniCell, he or she is alerted to the fact that there are different morphine long-acting products, the one they have chosen, and whether it is a 12 or 24-hour release formulation. At the end, they are asked if they wish to proceed. The nurse is then asked to confirm the choice he or she made on the first screen of the alert. If they said yes, they wish to proceed with the removal of the drug. In this screen, they are asked to confirm this choice, and then the next screen would be to remove the medication. If they said no, they didn't want to proceed, or they were unsure, they would be asked to confirm this choice, and would be routed back to the full list of medications found in the Omnicell. If you'll recall, in the environmental review that centered around medication errors, we learned that the way Cadian and MS Long were ordered and showed up in the PharmaNet was not clear. This slide is dedicated to interventions we put in place around ordering. To aid in clarity, prescribers ordering long-acting morphine must specify the brand name and or indicate whether it is a 12 or 24-hour long-acting formulation. If this information is not found within the order, like you can see in this text box here, the order cannot be processed, but rather must be clarified first. Cadian is being used for two different indications, chronic pain and opioid use disorder. At Providence Healthcare, a big focus of our work has been on addiction due to the patient population we serve. We have created several pre-printed orders for different medication used for opioid use disorder, such as methadone and suboxone. Hence, a pre-printed order was created for Cadian when prescribing for opioid use disorder. The Addictions Medicine team at Providence Healthcare wanted a pre-printed order to be created for a few reasons. The main one being to ensure that all Cadian orders for opioid use disorder had the order in place to have the Cadian sprinkled to avoid diversion. In this slide, you can see the pre-printed order on the left and then exactly how the Cadian order appears on the MAR. This is an example of key information that nurses need to know around a particular medication that is attached to the order by way of pre-building in the computer system so that each time the medication is ordered within the pre-printed order, it is automatically placed on the MER. As you can see in the Cadian order, the sprinkle it administered is written on the MER, exactly where my pointer is. In this slide, we give you the two different medication safety huddle sheets using Providence Healthcare's template to provide the key education to our clinicians. The first medication safety huddle sheet on your left speaks to there being different formulations of morphine long-acting capsules and the different mitigation strategies that have been put in place to mitigate the risk of selection error. The second medication safety huddle sheet on your right speaks to Cadian specifically, as this is a new drug on formulary. It is through medication safety huddle sheets that we routinely educate or inform our clinicians of changes or issues around medication. This slide, shows, this slide shows the medication safety huddle sheets that were published by Vancouver Coastal Health. As this project was a regional one, what you'll note is that the information shared is the same and only the template is different. At Providence Healthcare, when there is a different process created for residential care, we create medication safety huddle sheets that are specific to residential care to educate our clinicians. For residential care, we made both Cadian and Emeslon patient specific with no board stock to prevent selection errors. And it's currently found in this box here. So our next steps will be to continue to monitor incident reports on a regular basis to continue to evaluate the mitigation strategies we've put in place and discussed today and regroup if further interventions are necessary. And we have made a request from our vendor Accelerus 
to have the brand name for these two medications pulled forward to help prevent selection error by helping to make clear which morphine long-acting product was ordered in the community. This is information that PharmaNet has available, but we currently don't have it included in any of our PharmaNet forms. And this last slide is related to the references that we've utilized for this presentation. We thank you very much for listening. Thank you both for that detailed presentation. This problem is often under the radar with a risk of serious harm. Your initiatives to minimize the selection error between Cadian and Emeslon are excellent learning for all in both paper-based and electronic systems. So we'll now get into the observatory for some quick med safety updates. Since we took a few minutes at the beginning to describe the findings from our evaluation, we'll only have one update today, but future webinars will have two presenters in the observatory. We'll now have a CPSI update on their med safety initiatives. Thank you, Ambika, uh, and thanks uh, to everyone for attending today. We're quite pleased uh, with the results of the, uh, the pilot evaluation of this webinar series and uh, quite pleased to continue it uh, in partnership with ISMP Canada. So today uh, I'm going to focus a little bit on a corporate update from CPSI and then highlight uh, a few general uh, resources and initiatives um, that might uh, be useful for you in your patient safety improvement efforts, uh, and then we'll focus back on, on med safety um, probably at, at the next webinar. So um, after extensive consultation over the past year or so uh, with stakeholders and health system leaders, CPSI has recently launched our new strategic plan for the next five years called Patient Safety Right Now. Uh, and we have a, uh, a vision that Canada becomes the safest healthcare system in the world. Uh, and the focus uh, of our organization will continue to be on leading and promoting system strategies and strengthening commitment to patient safety throughout Canada. Uh, within this, we have four uh, new lines of business, uh, one being safety improvement projects, uh, second being policy impact work, uh, a third making patient safety a priority uh, among uh, policymakers uh, across Canada, and then continuing to focus on our alliances and networks with uh, stakeholders across Canada and internationally. Um, so a few mechanisms for our success uh, will be the implementation of frontline uh, patient safety improvement projects, uh, and there will be a med safety project uh, among these, so please stay tuned over the next several months. Um, a second is being uh, our evaluation. We are embedding uh, evaluation in all of our CPSI activities uh, to assemble the evidence of our effectiveness and the effectiveness of the uh, initiatives and approaches that we promote to our stakeholders. Uh, we're developing uh, a knowledge translation strategy to share with purpose uh, so that we can develop some strategies to share the best evidence and improvement knowledge with the field. Uh, again, we're focusing on raising the profile uh, so we see a continued need to raise the profile uh, of patient safety as being a public health issue um, in order to raise the expectations for improvement um, across the country. Um, a fifth one is focusing again on transparency, so addressing the rights and obligations uh, for patient safety transparency uh, and a commitment to learning at all levels, which I think this webinar series is a, is a good example of. Um, and then a sixth being commitment. So Again, focusing on uh, strengthening the commitment to safe care uh, through policy, regulation, and accreditation. Uh, earlier this month, we celebrated the uh, five-year anniversary of the revising of the Canadian Incident Management uh, Analysis Framework. Um, so hopefully you've all seen this. If you haven't, it's a great tool that's available uh, in part or as a full package on our website. Uh, focuses on three main sec sections of incident analysis, um, the first being the incident management process. Um, so those are the actions that follow patient safety incidents, including near misses, which are all available, um, well appraised of. Um, the second is patient safety management, so actions um, that you can implement to proactively anticipate incidents and prevent them from occurring uh, instead of looking at uh, past harm. And then the system factors, so factors that help shape and are shaped by patient safety and incident management. These are things like legislation, policies, uh, building a strong culture, uh, people, processes, and resources. Uh, the, the toolkit continues to be updated regularly with new information. 
Um, so if you have any innovative ideas through your work, uh, examples of using the tool, uh, or come across some um, new evidence or approaches that should be included, uh, we would love to hear from you. Please reach out to us and we will include that um, on our website and in the, uh, in the actual toolkit. Um, and finally, I'd like to uh, present a, uh, a new initiative and project that we are working with, uh, working on this new this year, uh, called the Measurement and Monitoring of Safety Framework. Uh, this was created by Professor Charles Vincent and his colleagues from the Health Foundation in the UK, um, and it consists of five dimensions that organizations uh, or individual um, individual leaders, providers, patients, healthcare providers, and families as well can use to understand and guide their patient safety improvement. Um, the focus of the framework um, is shifting away from a sole focus on past cases of harm um, towards current performance, future risks, as well as organizational resiliency um, to safety. Uh, this will be one of the safety improvement projects that CPSI will be implementing over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, as outlined in our strategic plan. And the measurement really uh, arms or aims to arm users with questions and knowledge um, so you can make better decisions about the safety care uh, that you are providing. Questions such as, has patient care been safe in the past? Again, that's looking past. Um, are our clinical systems and processes reliable currently? Is our care safe right now? Will our care safe or will our care be safe in the future? And are we responding and improving effectively um, after learning from these? Uh, we have three webcasts that have been archived and that are available on our website, so I highly recommend taking a look at those. You can watch them at your leisure if you're interested in more information on it. Um, the first one is actually introducing the framework, so we have experts that will come in and explain the various parts of the framework, how to use it, how to measure um, and improve and monitor. Um, the second is implementing it at the front line. Um, and the third one is how your board uh, can use the framework in their strategic planning and their oversight and governance role. Um, so again, please visit our website if you have more information uh, or send us an email if you'd like uh, more information specifically uh, on, the, uh, on the framework and we'd be happy to provide um, you with more information or uh, uh, additional resources to understand. Thank you and back to you, Ambika. Thank you, Steve. So we will, we do appreciate all the great information shared by our speakers today and we'll now turn our attention to the questions that we've been receiving and we're continuing to receive uh, to keep the learning going. Uh, thanks, Ambika. And our, our first few questions will be directed towards uh, our uh, uh, neonatology fluid case uh, that we had first. And our, our first question um, has been asked of us a, a few times actually, so I'll, I'll combine the three questions into one. And can you give us a sense of what you were, or what the NICU unit was using in terms of um, gravity uh, pumps versus uh, drug air reduction systems versus smart pumps versus syringe drivers prior to the incident, and have you made any changes after the incident? Can you hear me? Yeah, you as we can. Okay, um, so we already have uh, smart pumps in place. Um, however, the problem there becomes if the patient, or sorry, if the uh, bag to pump to patient check is not done, um, then the free flow may still happen. It has to be inserted. Yeah, uh, because the the syringes or the the tubing has to be inserted into the smart pumps for the safety part to to occur. So if that part was bypassed accidentally, then the problem will still be there. But um, we, we already have the smart pumps, uh, smart pumps in place for all of our patients in the NICU. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned this, but could you elaborate on the limitations in the bag sizes that you have? Um, our, our limitations in the bag sizes are that the commercially available bags um, only come in particular sizes. So. Uh, previously, when we used the 10W as our standard solution, I believe the 500 mil bags were the smallest bag size, so we weren't able to use a smaller volume for that. When we changed over to the, um, after the incident, when we changed over to the 250 mil, um, sorry, 50 mil milliliters D5W, that was, um, we chose the D5W simply because we had smaller commercially available bag sizes for that. The other thing that we're not sure is um, if the bag was, or the tubing was in the pump and removed and there was a clamp failure, 
when the bag was removed or the tubing was removed from the pump, if that's what happened as well. We're not sure about that because the tubing had been discarded. All right, a second question for the same group. Um, although certainly a severe problem in, in neonatology, uh, free-flowing IV solutions remain a problem in all patient groups, and we know of another, a number of incidents, instances where IV opioid bags ran through and caused significant harm in adults. Um, are some of your learnings applicable to other age groups? I, I believe so. I believe if it's a free-flowing issue, then this becomes a problem in all um, populations. We've also had a similar situation where a 3% sodium chloride bag uh, was infused into a pediatric patient uh, accidentally as well. All right, uh, thank you. Um, we'll move on to a few questions from the, the morphine slash Cadian case uh, number two. Um, our first question is, how do you mitigate the risk when providers order different frequencies for their narcotics. For example, m Eslon every eight hours, or they do order Cadian every 12 hours for patients that need the drugs more frequently or who are accustomed to that frequency. Right, thank you for the question. So um, at the point when we were deciding on the nomenclature, we were already aware that um, people do use them more frequently than you know the 24 hour versus the 12 hour. So that's part of the reasoning why we didn't include the uh, 12 hour or 24 hour description in the nomenclature because we don't want people to be confused. And that was also uh, taught in our education that you know these medications are you know supposed to be 24 hour or you know 12 hour release, but again they could be used more frequent uh, in you know pain control cases. And if we if you go back to our earlier slide on the PPO, you would notice that there is actually an option to order Cadian uh, Q12 as well because we do see that in practice. And if there were any questions, we would seek for clarification, right? So if the clinicians, whether it was the nurse or the pharmacist, um, had questions, they would seek clarification to make sure that that was the actual intent. And did you try to use other differentiation characteristics, like using different sorts of terms, like sustained release or extended release or, or, or other ways of differentiating the two products? Uh, no, because there are like various products out on the market that are, that are you know, sustained release, extended release, and I think with our regional nomenclature standards, we've um, chose to standardize that long-acting is the only type of wording that we would use around all these sort of different types of release formulation, and we've always stuck to that. So uh, we believe that that provides clarity for our clinicians. And a third question, if you employ um, hospital discharge prescriptions generated from the MARS or the hospital pharmacy system, how is this information communicated and are there safeguards for community pharmacists or community care areas uh, to prevent misunderstanding? Well, again, going back to our nomenclature, um, it's standardized to uh, include the brand name in there as well. So it says morphine bracket Cadian or morphine bracket MS one. So I believe that would be quite clear to our community partners what um, drug they're supposed to dispense. Um, all right, and um, we'll ask you the, the final question here. What steps did you take uh, to determine which nomenclature changes to make. I mean, traditionally we write orders or we accept orders in a drug, dose, formulation, order, but your changes um, that you've made suggest drug, formulation, dose may be better. Um, did you have any principles in mind when you arrived to that point? All right, so uh, we've had you know, a number of discussions at our regional group uh, with a you know, group of medication safety pharmacists. Uh, we do have our standard nomenclature standards where, you know, we would use the drug and the um, formulation as needed and then the strain. Um, and in this case, we realized that, you know, including the brand name would make it uh, definitely clearer for frontline staff to decipher between the different formulations because there are more than one type of long-acting product. And because of the principle of, you know, sometimes character limits with our pharmacy systems and also knowing, you know, it's human nature that people don't necessarily read, you know, to the very end of you know, the drug descriptor, we uh, thought that bringing the brand name forward just right after the word morphine would aid in um, preventing errors because you, know, you see the brand name uh, up front. So uh, we, that's sort of how we arrived at our decision. 
And a, a final, final question for you. Um, was delisting MS law in, available in capsules in, in favor of MS cotton, which is in tablets, an option? Um, I believe we kind of thought about that, however, um, because we do have our contract, uh, our provincial contract with um, how we get our drugs. Uh, it depends on the manufacturer, and so we couldn't really always stick to uh, a certain type of product, and especially with um, shortages and back orders happening all the time, it's uh, really tough to sort of just use that as um, a mitigation strategy because we know we couldn't always count on it, so we elected not to. Uh, thank you. Um, this question is for uh, Steve Rutledge from uh, CPSI. Um, you've identified the high-level strategic plan for CPSI, and will this change what we see from CPSI on the ground, and what will it look like for us providing health care? Um, outstanding question. So um, there will be some changes. Um, like I mentioned, we're really trying to push uh, making patient safety a priority, so we're looking at um, engaging patients, um, frontline providers, um, that promoting patient safety as a, uh, a current health issue that, that should require uh, additional resources, um, more attention from policymakers um, at that high level. So um, again, we're trying to kind of push patient safety in general uh, up the ladder, uh, so to speak, as an issue that uh, should be addressed. Um, uh, across Canada uh, at the policy level and then in federally at, at Health Canada. And then at the frontline level, um, to answer that, I think the, the most relevant piece will be the safety improvement projects. Um, so to go alongside with a lot of our policy work and, and promoting patient safety as a priority, um, we're going to be implementing some um, those safety improvement projects which will be working uh, with teams at the front lines to really look at uh, developing resources, tools, those sorts of things um, for people working at those front lines. So um, the first one which I mentioned today was the measuring and monitoring uh, of safety framework. That's going to be one of them. Um, we're putting the final details over the next couple of weeks uh, on a medication safety one as well, uh, but those will be very, very much targeted uh, interventions similar to uh, when we had uh, Safer Healthcare Now as, as one of our key programs. So um, that, that's probably where you're going to see it, uh, and then naturally we're going to continue with our work um, for everything in between uh, with respect to KT uh, and then developing new resources uh, for you to implement, uh, adapt, and use at your local site. And a follow-up question, uh, Stephen, about um, these programs. In particular, um, how will you decide or how are you going to build in the measurement and monitoring uh, framework um, into uh, sort of the current institute? So I think this, this person in particular is interested in how it's going to work in their own institution. Yeah, so we're trying to basically use that framework in, in everything we're developing from now on uh, to ensure that those key dimensions are assessed in, in anything that we um, are putting out. And then uh, we will be um, implementing um, that framework with a, a number of different sites. Um, I believe it already is um, our team. I'm not on the team, but the team that's working through that, uh, they are working with some pilot sites. They've been uh, in different areas of Canada over the last several months different sized organizations to get a sense on, on how this um, this framework will work uh, at the front lines. Uh, and then we've, we, we're working closely with um, the researchers that developed it in the UK as well. So they're providing some guidance on, on some of the implementation concepts, challenges, and things we need to consider uh, and help guide uh, our institutions that will be using it. So um, stay tuned with that. If you'd like more detailed information on how you can incorporate this into your uh, your local contacts, please reach out to us and I can put you in touch with the experts here at CPSI that, uh, that are leading that project. Great. Thank you so much to all our speakers. Um, we do still have some questions uh, coming in, but I will try to email those directly to our presenters and we'll try to get those responses to you. We've uh, just run out of time today. Thank you all for, the, for a great discussion.
So we do want everyone to be part of the med safety exchange, whether it's an incident analysis or a med safety initiative. So please email me to share the learning. And don't forget to fill out the poll that's uh, available in the bottom right corner. It's the same questions that can uh, be asked in an email if you register. So whichever is easier to, for you to fill out. But as Mike mentioned, we are always looking for feedback and we always want to keep improving. And the registration for the next webinar on Wednesday, July 25th is now open on the webpage, so you can head over to sign up. Thank you again to all our speakers for the important analyses and strategies shared today, and to all our participants for joining the discussion and helping to share the learning. So I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day, and bye for now.